From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see all these things, you know that he is near or it is near, that's how it might be in many of your translations, at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. I'd have you just take a note as we begin our passage here that the application to what we're reading here to a large extent is what the Lord Jesus says in this last verse. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. The Lord Jesus actually uses on two different other occasions a similar phrase, but on those occasions he says that the law of God or the word of God or the scriptures cannot be broken. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the law or scriptures of God will not pass away. And now the Lord Jesus speaks of his own words standing the exact same place. He speaks with that same kind of prophetic authority. He's calling his disciples to put their hope and their trust and their focus on what he has said and they're to remember his word when everything around them is, in a sense, being fulfilled and all of the awful things that he is proclaiming and prophesying, even in this passage, are being fulfilled. But here's the observation I want us to start with. We don't have a, a great introduction this morning. We just want to make an observation right off the bat from the passage that we've just read. And let your eyes focus in on verses 32 through 35. But having read the rest of the passage, you'll have picked up on this as well. And let's make an observation here. Let's just say this. The Lord Jesus is interested in his people in every age. The Lord Jesus is interested in his people in every age. As he speaks, as he teaches, as he instructs, as he answers James and John and Peter, his interest is not only in James and John and Peter. He's interested in his people and those who come up after them in every age. And he's interested in us. And he's interested in those who come after us. And he speaks his words directly to people in every age. What I want you to consider here are the pronouns that are being used. Jesus is speaking to James and John and Peter in answer to a couple questions that they've asked. Basically, they've asked, he's told them that the temple is about to be destroyed. They say, when is the time, that, when will, what will be the sign of that taking place and when will it happen? And they conflate this with the end of the age, the end of that period of time that will then be taken over by the Messiah coming and reigning upon the earth. And that's the end of the age. When will be the sign of the end of the age and of your appearing? They put them together. The Lord Jesus, to a large extent, in his answer, will allow these to be mixed together and held together to some extent, although there are subtle things Christ says that pull them apart from their understanding and for their consideration as time goes on and as time goes by. But they've asked this question, and in answer... Jesus speaks to them of certain things that will take place. In fact, in answer to the question, when what will be the sign of Jerusalem's, of, of the temple's destruction, he, you'll find the answer given in Luke chapter 21. By the way, here's another thing that we've mentioned before, but Mark chapter 13, Luke chapter 21, Matthew chapter 24 are all recounting the Olivet Discourse. That's what this is called, this moment in time when the Lord Jesus is particularly speaking to these three of his disciples and giving him this instruction in Luke 21, the Lord Jesus tells them that the sign of Jerusalem's destruction will be its surrounding by an army. And that army was surrounded. It was surrounded in about uh, 60, 66 AD, four years before 70 AD when the temple was destroyed and it was fulfilled. And so he gives them that prophecy. And then the Lord Jesus telescopes out from that point in time in his answer to the question to the end of the age and those things related to the end of the age and he tells them of an unknown time that's beyond them which he will later reveal to them he doesn't exactly know himself only the father knows but an end of the age when a individual will rise up who is the antichrist and he will appear in a future temple and he will make himself the object of worship and the Lord Jesus references him by referring to him as the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel and you can find that the prophet Daniel in Daniel chapter 11 applied this image of the abomination of desolation to a leader that came up at the end of the Greek empire by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. It happened between the Old Testament period and the New Testament period and he took over the temple and he set himself up, he set up the worship of uh, the god 
Jupiter in the temple, or Zeus, I can't remember which one, Zeus, I think it was, the Greek god Zeus, and he allowed himself to be considered the epiphany or the embodiment of Zeus, and he ended the sacrifices in the temple, and he called the people of Israel to worship him. That led to a great revolt, and ultimately he was overthrown by the Maccabeans, and that was known as the abomination of desolation. It's spoken of very clearly through a series of very clear prophetic statements that Daniel gave some 400 years prior to the event that Daniel gave of this dissolution of the Greek empire and this intrigue of this man that comes upon and establishes himself to be worshiped in the temple, the abomination of desolation. But then in Daniel chapter 12, Daniel speaks again of this, but now he projects it to the end of the age and to a time period that will take place at the end of the age in the middle of what Daniel has revealed to be, or has had revealed to him to be a seven year tribulation. And in the middle of that seven year tribulation, he speaks again of this abomination of desolation that will rise up in the middle of that period. And so he's projecting from that story of Antiochus Epiphanes a projection of prophecy that goes to the end of the age. In the same way, the Lord Jesus is taking this story of the destruction of the temple that's coming ahead in 70 AD, and he projects it out to the end of the age in the same pattern that Daniel does. And we mentioned this last week, but Paul refers to this, this antichrist. He refers to this evil one as the embodiment or the culmination of and the concentration of all the false Christs and all the antichrists that have risen up prior to that time. And as the antichrist rises up, he also has alongside of him one who is considered the prophet, who is in a sense the epitome of all the false prophets that come in the end of the age. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4, Paul describes this evil one. He calls him the man of sin and the man of lawlessness. In verse 3, And then it says this in verse four, who, quote, opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. See, very similar to what happened with Antiochus Epiphanes back in the the intertestamental period or that history between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, but now as something that's projected out at the end of times. But here's what I want you to see. So the Lord Jesus is referring to and directing them something that's gonna come at the very end of the age. Here's what I want you to see though. As the Lord Jesus answers James and John and Peter, I want you to see the pronoun that he uses. You, he says, you. In Matthew 24 verse 15 for example, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel standing in the whole place. Verse 33 that we've just read. When you see all these things, you know that he's near at the very gates. Now, what we know is that not only uh, that, that of all of those three, only John was living at the time that Jerusalem was overtaken by the Romans and General Titus was his name and Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed in 70 AD and we also know that John wasn't in Jerusalem at that time so he didn't see these things take place and we know that none of them are gonna be around at the end of the age when the abomination of desolation takes place and the man of lawlessness is revealed that Paul was talking about in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. It hasn't happened yet and yet when the Lord Jesus speaks to them He speaks to them using this term, you. He puts them in that moment, in that time. And how are we to understand these things? How are we to make sense that the Lord Jesus answers these three with this pronoun, you, when you see this, when you see this. And all through this prophecy, all through the Olivet Discourse, he speaks to them as you. And I think what we need to understand is that the Lord Jesus, as he speaks to them, is pressing forward to speak to those upon whom these events will fall. The Lord Jesus is interested in those who in the hour of that moment will be alive and they will have access to his words and he speaks directly to them in that hour and he wants them to understand and discern what is happening in that moment and his words will warn them of that hour and they will also encourage them in that hour and so the Lord Jesus in a sense is speaking all the way out to those who will be present at that moment when they see these things taking place. At the same time we have to understand that Jesus is answering James and John and Peter. And he wants them to hear the instruction that he's giving for themselves. He wants them to mentally, in a sense, put themselves in that hour and to provoke from them the same kind of anticipated faith that will be needed for those 
who will, that hour will actually come upon them and will actually take place. And so in the same way, I would say this, that the Lord Jesus is speaking to us. He's telling us that in a sense, we must have that same kind of anticipatory faith to recognize that his words will be fulfilled and we must be willing in a sense to project ourselves just as Christ was projecting James and John and Peter into that hour, we must be willing to project ourselves into that hour. Because the test in the midst of that truth is how will we respond? What will we trust in? That will be the test for those who actually go through it and experience it. Uh, do, Do you ever, by the way, run any drills in your imagination? Do you imagine scenarios or situations and think through your mind what you might do in a case of a great emergency? Our home right now has been approved by the government to give us permission. This just happened in the last year. We now have government, the government's permission to take care of our son, Jack Henry. As you know, Jack Henry has some significant handicaps. But in order to go on with the government's permission to take care of Jack Henry, Every month we have to have a fire drill in our home. We have to pretend the house is on fire and we have to find our way of escape and we have to know where we're going to meet and we've got to get Jack out of the house and we do it every week. We, we have some kind of exercise. We run some kind of drill in case that situation might take place and come upon us. I think as we look at this passage that the Lord Jesus wants his disciples to run the drill. Just after this, the Lord Jesus will say of that hour, no man knows except for my father. Maybe it's possible that the Lord Jesus doesn't know whether James and Peter and John will be the yous, the ones that will see that hour. Maybe he he doesn't know that it will be us or others. But he speaks in such a way that they run the drill. They run the experience through their own minds and they consider their own response to the situation and ultimately the outcome of the response is they're to trust in his word. They're to endure, they're to look to him, they're to count upon him. They are to, we are to run the drill. We're to live not ruling ourselves out from anything that might come before us and that Christ speaks of, but consider it as something that we must at least be willing to enter into in our minds and Having said all that, by the way, I'll just tell you that I, I believe, just if anyone's curious, I believe in what's called a pre-tribulation or rapture. I believe that the Lord Jesus is coming. I'm anticipating that I'll be raptured and be, if she should come and the tribulation should come upon us. My anticipation is that I'll be raptured out of that experience. We don't find this in this passage. I've not been preaching on it. I have a, a reason for why I believe this, and, and that's that the Bible reveals to us a certain sense of eminency of Christ's return for his people, that it could come at any time and at any moment. And it's not merely impending, it's eminent. Your death is impending, but I think most of you are here thinking that your death is not eminent, right? But the return of Jesus Christ for his people, the Bible reveals is eminent. And so if I am to hold to that view of the eminency of the return of the Lord Jesus, it seems to me most reasonable that I should consider that that return would be before the tribulation. It would be pre-tribulation. Otherwise, there's all kinds of other things that have to happen before he comes for me. Now listen, if I'm wrong, I'll still hold to the eminency of Christ's return. If I find myself in the middle of the tribulation, I'll think, well, he's going to come in the middle of the tribulation. I'm still waiting. It's eminent. And if I'm wrong and it goes to the very end of the tribulation, I'm still going to hold to the eminency of his return. But until we are in the middle of the tribulation and all these things are taking place, it could happen to me. I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture because I believe in the eminency of his return. That's just being practical here. I'm just being practical with you. And it has nothing to do with what we're going to preach on this morning. But just in case you, just to add a further confusion to what we're talking about this morning, I thought I would mention it. You're welcome. Well, let's look at this passage. We are to, the point is, and even what I've just said to you is helpful in running this exercise. The point is, we're to allow ourselves to be in this drill. We're to allow ourselves to consider these things. Christ is speaking to those who will experience it at the end of the age. He is directing their eyes upon it. They will have this text before them. They will see these truths. And yet he's saying you to James and John and Peter. And now he's saying you to us. We're to be in the drill. We're to see all these things as potentially coming upon ourselves. And now that we look at the passage, we have to ask a series of questions. And so this passage is is a very difficult passage. I have to tell you that in studying it, that every single authority has somewhat of a different twist on where this passage is going and what they think it says. And you can almost anticipate what it is that they are going, and the arguments going to use for the, 
uh, based on whatever their, in a sense, their broader theology is, influences how they read this passage, and then they bring to, get, get to bear all of their kind of exegetical know-how on how to interpret scripture to come up with the result that you know they're gonna come up with to a large extent because of their theological position. And so, um, what do I wanna say about this? If you don't agree with where I'm gonna take you in this, this morning, uh, then you're fine. You're in the company of a lot of people because not very many people agree with me on this one, all right? No one is gonna get excommunicated from the church because I think, I think Joel has got it wrong here. But at the same time, I'm before God's word, I'm wanting to be under it and under its authority, and I must present it to you as I understand it and as I see it. Here are the questions that we need to answer. What does the fig tree represent? Here's another one. What is the time being referenced here? And another one will be, who makes up the generation that will not pass away? What does the fig tree represent? What is the time being referenced? Who makes a generation that will not pass away? Let's actually answer the question, what is the time that's being referenced here? Because that's where you have the greatest amount of consensus from those who study this passage. And what we can probably say is the most obvious answer is that within the context of what we've just read in this passage, the most obvious answer is that it's referencing that time in the middle of the tribulation when the abomination of desolation takes place and the Antichrist asserts himself in the temple as God, we're referring to that time up to the time in which Christ appears coming in the clouds. And so it's at the time of the abomination of desolation. It's at the time when the elect who are present are told to flee from Jerusalem uh, to escape a great tribulation that is going to be coming upon them like history has never known will, or will ever know. It's a time when if it was not cut short, there would be no humans that would survive. And by the way, Daniel tells us that it's cut short because it only lasts for three and a half years. And Daniel makes it very plain to us. It's a time that includes the cosmic convulsions that take place just before the coming of Christ in judgment that he brings upon the earth and also before he comes to bring all the elect to mourn and repent at the sight of his coming and gathers them to himself. It's from the middle of the tribulation to the last moments before the coming of Christ. This is the time that is being referenced here and there will be some who will see these things take place. And Jesus is telling them that when they do, they can know that the gates of heaven will soon swing wide open and Christ will come in the clouds. And he's told them this. His word is true and they can stand upon it and rest upon it. Heaven and earth will fade away. But you trust me, he's basically saying to them in that moment. You don't be deceived in this hour. You be on guard. You endure in the midst of this tribulation, in the midst of these trials. Whatever you face, whatever persecution comes upon you, I am coming, that's the, that's the basic idea here that he's communicating and he says it to Peter, James and John. He says it to us. He says it to those who might be the ones who are reading this text in that hour. Now let's answer the other question which I think is the more important question and maybe the more controversial question. It's what does this fig tree represent? What does this fig tree represent? And here what I must tell you is the most common answer that you'll find over and over again is that it is that it merely represents a heads up statement or counsel from the Lord Jesus. Basically what he's saying is, you know, the idea is this, that every little child in Israel knew that when winter had come to the end and the sap began, everything began to warm up and the sap began to run in the different branches of the trees and they became pliable and the leaves began to form their buds on the tree that they knew the season was turning and they were turning out from winter and they were turning into summer and it's kind of nice to consider that. It means that every little child has had the same thrill that we still have today when we see that winter is over, spring is coming, and summer's on its way. And so basically it's just saying, look, you just add these things together, you see these things are happening, and you just know, the lesson basically is that, that, that when you see certain things happening, you know that other things are soon to follow. When you see the, 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 the branch becoming tender, and you see that things are, and the, the bud is, the, 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 the tree is beginning to produce its leaves, just know that summer is coming in the same way, in the same way, when you see things like the abomination of desolation in the temple, <laughs> when you see deceiving miracles of false prophets and antichrist, and things like the sun and moon becoming dark, well then, heads up, know that Christ is coming. A little kind of obvious for me. I, I have a problem if that's the, frankly, I have a problem if that's the interpretation of the text. I think that this is a reduction of this parable that is so overly simplified that although there is some truth in it, 
I think they miss the overall point. I don't think that Christ is merely saying things like, you know, when you see rain clouds, know that it's about to rain. And when you see the sun rising, know that the day is about ready to begin. And when you see the moon turn to blood, know that my peering is right around the corner. I, I don't think that that is what Christ is proclaiming. There, there's a danger when you're reading the parables of Christ of reading too much into them, getting too much detail out of them, and you go off the rails doing that, but there's also a danger of reading too little. And as we look at this passage, it may be true that in part the Lord Jesus is communicating this parable as a heads up warning to know that they're moving into this time period and to also at that time give them some sense of encouragement. I think we'll see that, but it also he's also saying things that are quite specific. He's revealing something in the fig tree that is representing something that we need to take note of. And so let me point out a few things to you. In Matthew 21 through 25, you have a record of the teaching of the Lord Jesus during the last week of his life in Jerusalem before he goes to the cross and dies on the cross. And in those passages, there are seven parables that the Lord Jesus pronounces. And each one of those parables indicates some important element or concern regarding the kingdom and its coming and his demand or call upon those before the kingdom comes. He's looking for them to be on guard and he's looking for them to be looking, but he's also looking for them for repentance and a turning to him. And so there are these seven parables and this parable comes right in the middle of those seven parables. And it fits, it should fit, we should see that it fits into a pattern. Jesus uh, was uh, in Matthew chapter 21, when the Lord Jesus comes, there's another thing that we need to kind of add into the mix in understanding what this parable means. When the Lord Jesus arrives in Jerusalem, the people are all rejoicing and they're throwing palm branches before them and they're excited because they think he's gonna come to throw off the power of Rome, that he's gonna establish himself as the Messiah. And by the end of the week, they're stunned because he doesn't bring his judgments and pronunciations against Rome and Roman powers. Instead, the whole week long, he brings his pronunciations of judgment against Israel, against Jerusalem. They think he's coming to rescue Jerusalem and judge the world, and he comes to say that he's announcing judgment upon Jerusalem, and they're a little bit discouraged by this. In fact, by the end of the week, instead of greeting with palm branches, they greet him with the phrase, crucify him, crucify him. Because he didn't give them what they wanted. He didn't give them what they expected. He pronounced judgments upon them. You have to recognize that as well. And he pronounces his judgments upon them and the leaders because they don't don't repent of their sins and they don't turn to God. That's the overall message. So what do we say about this passage, the fig tree? And I'll simply say this. The fig tree is not simply a figure lesson of putting two two and two together to make four. The fig tree stood for something in itself. It stood for Israel. And it stood for Christ's mission and Christ's concern for Israel. It stands for the appearance of Israel at the end of history when Christ is coming. He is anticipating that the Jews will be, he's just said in Luke chapter 21, you'll see that he says that Israel will be desolated and that Jerusalem will be tramped upon by the Gentiles and this will continue until the time of the Gentiles is over with. But now in this passage, the Lord Jesus is indicating that Israel will be back and reconstituted in the land and that God will still have a plan for them and they will be embroiled in the intrigues of the tribulation period. And So let me build a case for this so you understand this. The first thing I want you to see here is that the prophets used the fig tree as a figure of Israel. If you go back and look in Jeremiah chapter 24, for example, Jeremiah is prophesying a judgment that's coming upon Judah and in that prophecy he, he presents the unrepentant nation and those who were unrepentant in the nation as spoiled figs, as bad fruit because they have not brought forward repentance and because of that God is about ready to come upon them in judgment and they're about ready to experience sword and famine and pestilence. He also speaks of good fruits or good figs in chapter 24 of Jeremiah 7. And these are individuals, he says, who will know God because they will return to God with their whole heart. In other words, they're good figs because they'll repent and they'll turn back from their sin and they'll turn to God. And so there's the bad fruit which are unrepentant and there are the good fruit that are are repentant. And that's, uh, that's the portrait of Israel in the image of the fig. Now, let's put this to John the Baptist. John the Baptist comes years later. John the Baptist is a prophet and he comes before the nation 
and he's preaching a message. And what is John the Baptist's message in essence? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is ha- at hand. The Messiah is coming and, and you as a nation and you as a people need to repent. And the people began to gather to John the Baptist in order to hear this message. And John the Baptist also said, listen, he says the, the, the ax of God is at the root of the trees and the trees are about ready to be cu- cut down and what God is looking for is he's looking for the fruit of repentance. And don't say to yourself, well, we don't have to repent or turn to God because we're the children of Abraham because God can raise up any tree to be his ch- child. You need to repent. In fact, go to Matthew chapter three. Let's read verses one through 10, which gives us the witness of John the Baptist's ministry. Matthew writes, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of the prophet Isaiah saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea and all the region around Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, these are the leaders of Israel, coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee the wrath from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones, And even now the ax is laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Again, the message is to the Jewish people and the Jewish nation. And it's a call that they bring forth the good fruit of repentance that God found in a remnant through the word of Jeremiah back in Jeremiah 24. Well, quickly, repentance is the acknowledgement of sin. Repentance is a turning away from that sin into obedience that God desires. Repentance is above all a changing of our mind to set our heart and our mind and our souls upon loving God and surrendering our lives into his hand. It's it's turning back from our own self-interest and our own self-salvation and our own self-governance and it's yielding our lives over completely to the governance and the salvation that only God can provide. Repentance is actually not a harsh word. It's a call of God that is kind and loving. It's an invitation. It's a call to recognize the sin that separates from him and to understand that sin has horrific consequences if it's carried out and pursued. It's a call back to God, the God of life, the God who would rescue us from destruction, the God who's in his very nature is one to bless and to benefit. And it's a recognition that if you don't return to him, there will be an increasing breakdown and spoiling of all things that are good and beneficial because you're separated from the God who gives all good and beneficial things. So when you read the word repentance, don't think of it as a harsh word, but as an invitation of God into blessing and purpose and life and a warning that apart from him and without turning to him, you go into judgment, you go into destruction. It's just the the inevitable consequence of turning away from the God of life. And John comes calling the nation of Israel to God in repentance and warning them that if they don't repent, they will be cut down in judgment. And he uses the fig tree as an example, just as Jeremiah did. Now, When Jesus comes along, we're told that he carried on the same message that John carried on. You'll read that the Lord Jesus' message that he proclaimed, as it's typified for us in the first chapter of Mark, and also as he gave it to his disciples to preach, was the same message that John uh, preached. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, turn to God. God's salvation is offered to you through myself. He has a way for you to enter into his kingdom. And so he had the same message that he was preaching, that John was preaching. And it's a message that also was preached by the prophets like Jeremiah. Now there's a a book that's very helpful for me in understanding this passage. It's a book called Life of Christ in Stereo. It's it's written by a gentleman named named Johnston Cheney and a professor that I actually studied from when I was in seminary years ago. And the book takes the four gospel accounts and it folds them all together in one account and it does so in such a way that it doesn't add one Greek word and it doesn't take away one Greek word. It puts them all perfectly together and yet as you read these accounts from four different authors and you read the book, the beautiful thing, it's, it's, it's symmetrical. It reads and flows as if you're just reading from the Bible without any uh, bumps or hiccups or confusion and 
He wrote it over a number of years, and as he was writing it, on multiple occasions, he would go through various theological panels of men who knew the Greek and the Hebrew, and he would answer questions they asked, and he would go back and continue working on, in a sense, what he called a scrapbook of the Gospels, put all together in one uniform way. It's actually a really wonderful book. I'd encourage you to get it. If it's not in print, I'd encourage you to find a used copy of it. The Life of Christ in Stereo. One of the things that he had a problem with was he had a difficulty putting all of them together unless he did one thing. And one thing that was traditionally believed but is not necessarily to believe. And that was that Jesus' ministry didn't last for three years. His public ministry lasted for four years. And that it spanned over a four-year period of time. And when he did that, it all began to make sense and fall into place. And he gives a very convincing argue for this position. And I agree with him. But one of the positions, he, one of his arguments is to take us to Luke chapter 13. Take your Bibles quickly and go to Luke chapter 13. And there he shares the account of the Lord Jesus during what he would have us consider to be the Feast of Passover. And here the Lord Jesus around the time of the Feast of Passover, and this would be the second Feast of Passover before the last that Christ goes up to Jerusalem and offers himself up as the Passover lamb for our sins. And during this feast of Passover, in Luke chapter 13, a report comes to him of some Galileans who have offended the Roman authorities, Pilate, and Pilate has, in a sense, slaughtered them or killed them when they've come up to Jerusalem to make their sacrifices, so their blood is mixed with the sacrifices that they're bringing in the temple at that time, and there's a sense in those who are accounting this news to the Lord Jesus that they're making a judgment on these Galileans, like they were a bunch of rebels and they were rabble rousers and causing trouble, and the Lord Jesus actually turns it on them and says, do you think that you're gonna escape judgment as well? If you don't repent, he says, if you don't repent, and he repeats it twice, in this first part of Luke, of Luke chapter 13, if you don't repent, the same thing is going to happen to you. You're going to fall under the judgment of Rome as well, is what he's saying to them. And then he shares this par- parable in verses 6 through 9 of Luke chapter 13. Let's read it together. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. What was the fruit that John the Baptist was looking for? Repentance. Repentance. What was the fruit that Jeremiah saw and commended as good in, Luke 12, in Jeremiah 24? Repentance. Who was the fig tree? It was Israel. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, Look, for three years I've, consent, I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it, why does it use up the ground? Now, if the Lord Jesus had only been ministering for two years at that point in time, it wouldn't quite make sense that he would say three years, but it fits if he has carried out a ministry, a public ministry for three years, calling for repentance and looking for the repentance of the nation, this makes sense. It's not bore fruit, cut it down. But he, the keeper of the, of the fig trees, the grove, says, answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. Now the message here is repent. The message is that God is looking for repentance. The message is that there's been a failure to repent. It is a clear declaration, as in many of the Lord Jesus' parables, and what we'll also see in these parables, if you read them in, in Matthew chapter 1, 21 through 25, it's a, a, a clear series of parables addressing the needs and the, of the nation of Israel and their leaders to address this issue of repentance. It's the nation of Israel that's in view in this parable. God has been looking for its repentance over the three years of Christ's ministry. Israel has failed to bring forth that fruit of repentance. It should be cut down. The Lord Jesus pleads its cause. Let it go one more year. Give it one more year and more time to produce the important fruit. If it doesn't, then it will be cut down. So now, let me take you to Matthew chapter 24, or Matthews 21 through 25. Now the Lord Jesus is in Jerusalem at the time of Passover, and a year has passed. The year is over. And he comes into Jerusalem for the last Passover, and you know, we know the story. He's received by the people, rejoice, Hosanna is the name, one who comes in the name of the Lord, and the first thing he does is he enters into the temple, and he cleans out the temple, because there are robbers and thieves in it, and he throws over the table of the money changers, and he pronounces at that point in time a judgment against the leaders for making God's 
house of worship, a, a, you know, the house of prayer to be a, a place where they're simply um, get, seeking to gain their own advantages and enrich themselves on, uh, in the temple. And then he leaves and he goes out to Bethany. And the next morning he comes back, that's on a Sunday. He comes back into Bethany and now it's a Monday morning and as he comes back into Bethany, he sees a fig tree and it has leaves on it. One of the things you need to understand is that the way I understand it works is that the fig tree always produced its first fruit first and then leaves. So he goes over to see if there's some fruit on it, even if it's just young fruit. It would have just been young fruit. And he, he goes over to see, and it has no fruit on it whatsoever. And the Lord Jesus pronounces a curse on that fig tree. He says, may you never bear fruit again. And then he walks on by. He goes into the city. He pronounces some further statements and judgment over the nation of Israel and its leadership throughout that day. He leaves that day. He goes back to Bethany. Tuesday day morning, he's walking back into the city of Jerusalem again with his disciples from Bethany. And they see that same fig tree, and it's dead. It is dried up from the roots. It's withered away. The, 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 the one miracle of the Lord Jesus throughout his ministry that brings destruction is the miracle of the fig tree that he pronounces over the fig tree. During a week in which he's pronouncing judgment on the leadership of Jerusalem over and over again to such an extent that they crucify him because of their failure to produce repentance. Peter says, Master, look, the fig tree you've cursed is withered. And so Israel is in view there too. He's making the statement of what's taking place. They have not repented. The year has gone by. He has fertilized it with truth, and he's begun to continue to teach it, but they've not repented, and they're about ready to be cut down. Now, one day, maybe two days later, he's back in the temple teaching. He pronounces all of his woes against the leaders of Israel. He pronounces a series of woes. You see that in Matthew chapter 23 and chapter 24. At the very beginning, he tells his disciples that the temple is about ready to be destroyed and not one stone will be left upon the other. And they come to him asking when these things will take place and what will happen. So do you see the progression here? Israel is the fig tree. God is wanting the fruit of repentance from her. She has not produced that precious fruit. She's cursed. She's about to be cut down or moved. The disciples know the parable that Jesus told the year before. They witness the miracle of a living parable of the cursed fig tree. They are told of the destruction of Israel and the temple. They're told of another great desolation of Jerusalem that's coming at the end of the age. Both involve the treading down of the city by foreign powers. Both result in grave suffering for the Jews. The fig tree is, tr is cursed. It's withered. It's to be cut down. And then the Lord Jesus gives us this parable. And the parable of the fig tree. It may be a warning to keep your eyes open. It may be there's a sign here in all this. But Israel is the fig tree. Israel shall be the tender tree. That will once again be planted in Jerusalem at the end of the days. And the man of lawlessness or sin will rise up. And Antichrist shall rise up at that time to be worshipped in the temple. And he will turn his attention at that time on the destruction of the Jews. And here's what Jesus is saying. When you see these things happening, you know that the end is near. It's at the very gates. It's about ready to come upon you. In other words, God's kingdom program still includes the Jews. God's kingdom program still includes those who he has cursed and the withered fig tree. He's bringing it back into the land. Now the question is, one last question real quickly. What is the generation that shall not pass away? What is the generation that shall not pass away? If we understand all these things, we should see then that it's the generation that sees these things. It's the generation of Jews who are in Jerusalem and believers who are in the world at that time who endured the rage of the Antichrist and they should know that regardless of the energies that he is gonna pour out to seek their destruction, he will not succeed. He will not overcome. The generation that he is against and that he opposes will not be wiped out by him. There will be those who remain. If you've seen these things, then you know that your generation is going to endure and you will see these things. The Lord Jesus will soon be coming in the cloud for your rescue and to bring judgment upon those who seek your ruin. You be encouraged. Don't be deceived. You endured the end. You believe my word. You believe my word and you trust in me. Now, listen, Jesus tells them, I'm not speculating about these things, although I may, to some extent, be speculating here, folks. He is not speculating about these things. We know that those who see these things coming upon them will fully understand exactly what it was the you of this text will be seeing and exactly what he meant. They'll see it before their eyes. And his word will be fulfilled completely and faithfully and it will come to pass and 
At that time, there will be great persecution and there will be great tribulation and there also will be great deliverance because his purposes and his word will prevail. It can't be denied. Here are some conclusions for us through all of that. The conclusions go something like this, just two. The first one would be to take away for ourselves, both of these for ourselves, for us in this time. The first one is this. Jesus' language allows for James and John and Peter and us to put ourselves into this setting. It allows for us to put ourselves to that moment and that time, and that horrific time in history. And the question is, run the drill. Will you trust him? Will you trust him before these things? Well, right now, we're going through our own challenges, our own struggles, but nothing like this. Nothing like this. Are you losing heart yet? Are you going to weary yourself when you're running along the side of the Jordan or will you now be tired if you have to run with the horsemen? It's one of the, one of the prophets asks a question like that. Will you trust him? Will you rest in him? Will you know and believe that in spite of all these things he has his purposes and that he will accomplish them and that he will come and he will deliver us and he'll call us home even though we experience difficulty and hardship? Go to Luke chapter 21 for just a moment. In Luke chapter 21, the Lord Jesus is giving a message. It's, this is the parallel account in which he's preaching this message to his disciples. And as he presents them this need to trust him and endure in the midst of the challenges and difficulties they're going to face. And they are in their own day and age going to face very real and difficult challenges. And yet there's even something more horrific that's coming down the pipe down later on in the ages. But look what the Lord Jesus says in verses 16 through 19. It's almost curious. It's almost laughable. And yet he says this, you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends. They will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all for my namesake. They will put some of you to death. Did you see that? They will put some of you to death. Like, just kind of hang on there for a moment if you're reading it. They will put some of you to death. They'll put some of you to death and you'll be hated by all for my namesake. But not a hair on your head shall be lost. Oh, wait a second. You just said they're gonna put some of us to death but not a hair on our head will be lost. By your patience, possess your souls. Jesus is basically saying you're going to be betrayed. Some of you are going to be put to death. But trust me, endure down to the point of martyrdom and even death. Trust me, I've numbered all the hairs on your head and I'll raise you up. And when I raise you up, not one of your hairs are going to be missing. Trust me in all the difficulty. Trust me in all the trials. Endure. Rest in my word. I know what's coming. You can count on me. Run the drill. Run the drill. Even allow yourself to go to that hour and that age and that challenge and that difficulty. Run the drill. Are you going to believe in him? Are you going to trust in him? Do you believe he has a plan for you? He has a plan for you and he has a plan for the nations. And here's the other part. Whatever trials that evil people bring against God's people, they will not overcome God's purposes. They won't succeed in wiping out God's people. Christ has declared that he'll build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He's promised it. His words will endure. Count on it. And God has promised a place in his kingdom for all the nations that will bow before him one day from every tongue and every tribe and every nation. And that includes Israel. He has a promise designed for the Israel too. The enemy may hate them as the chosen people of God, but God has a plan for them. And one day that plan shall be fully kept. The tender fig tree with leaves that will face the brunt of demonic destruction will still be a people on the earth when Jesus returns. The destroyer will not wipe them out. They will see Christ coming in the clouds, bringing with him his rescue. And when they see them, him, they'll mourn and they'll repent and they'll bring to him the fruit he longed to see in his first coming and he'll rescue them. He'll be a savior to them, a deliverer to those who receive him unto themselves. And so shall we. That's God's program. What program are you committed to? When your life is all discombobulated, when everything is going wrong, you're about ready to give up. What program did you give yourself to? God says, give yourself wholly and commit yourself wholly to my program. 
I'm ruling over all things. Endure to the end. The very table we are going to participate in is a surrender ourselves to God's program. The Bible says that we eat this bread and we drink this cup in remembrance of what Christ did for us, but it also says that we are to proclaim the Lord's death and eating it until he comes. And then the Lord Jesus says when he comes, we'll eat it with him in the kingdom. It's declaring a program that will prevail. It's a program that prevails through suffering and difficulty and hardship that we are called into as well. But trust me, trust me, he says, my word is true. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. We sing the song, we rest on thee, our shield and our defender. We go not forth alone against the foe. We praise you, O God, that you go with us. Your word goes before us and precedes us. Every difficulty, every challenge, we hear you saying, did not I tell you it would be so? But I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Some shall be put to death, but not one hair on your head will be lost. Trust in me. God, we thank you that what we read and hear as promised for ourselves as individuals is secure for us in the recognition that what you promised and what you gave to nations will be fulfilled. You'll keep your word to them. You'll keep your word to Israel. You'll keep your word to us. Our redemption, their redemption, will enhance the ongoing praises of eternity in heaven. That day when we'll enter into the kingdom with you together. Oh Lord, we long for that day. Your program answered and fulfilled. Feasting with you at this table. <laughs> Rejoicing in what you've done for us. Help us to live in light of those things. Give us courage and boldness and faith. Through every trial we go to, to trust in you. We pray in Jesus' name.